Then Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. After a few days, the younger son gathered together all he had and left on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth with a wild lifestyle. Then after he had spent everything, a severe famine took place in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and worked for one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He was longing to eat the carob pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have food enough to spare, but here I am dying from hunger. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way from home, his father saw him and his heart went out to him. He ran and hugged his son and kissed him. Then his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Hurry, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened cow and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. Because of his, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Shane gives me the clicker but he doesn't give me any tissues. And he leaves me sitting there. <sighs> get through a sermon when my nose is running and my eyes are leaking. But I'm glad to see you all here. I'm glad to see the, well, I can't see the northerners, but oh, thank you. Like, I seriously need a tissue. Give me a moment. Live streaming. <laughs> all right. All right, that's good. Um, yes, it's great to see, not to see the northerners. Uh, you have left a hole in our congregation. We look forward to having you back with us next week. But we're also really glad that you have managed to, um, you know, get together and have this warm Christmas in July um, up at Deception Bay and um, singing Christmas carols, but also being able to join us. So, hello. Um, also looking forward to meeting any new people out at supper. And uh, yes, I forgot my coat, so I should perhaps run out to my car first before we do that. Hope you feel very welcome here, though. A couple of years ago, um, we held a congregational meeting here and formulated our ways of working together. Um, this was a set of principles that we aspire to as a congregation that kind of guides us to be a congregation that lives well together and works well together. And that meeting resulted in these four principles. This is the first one. As a diverse congregation, we seek to value and respect the diversity of people, beliefs, opinions, and experiences within our congregation, knowing that diversity makes us a better congregation. The second one was we understand that conflict can fester and then escalate quickly. So we had to handle interpersonal conflict early with vulnerable honesty and involve only the people who need to be involved. We try to stay focused on solving the problem and avoid attacking the person. And we aim to understand the other's viewpoint even when we disagree, especially when we disagree. Uh, privacy and confidentiality are important to us. This is our number three. And so we're cautious about sharing other people's personal information, including stories, photos, videos, that might be sensitive. And we try and check in uh, if we're in doubt. And the final one was that we seek to continually grow in personal maturity and self-awareness, taking responsibility for our, our own behaviour, feelings and boundaries. We're not afraid to apologise and we're not afraid to get help when we need it. So they're our kind of ways of working together. And I guess that that exercise of having a congregational meeting and, and coming up with, with um, 
all of these points that we kind of put into these four points, that can be a nice thing to do. Um, something that you can put on your website and then just kind of forget about it. But we're actually really serious about these four things. In fact, if you came to a recent, uh, one of our recent newcomer Connect gatherings, you'll know all about these four things because we actually spent a bit of time unpacking them. And I think about these four things. I think about these four things a lot. And the more I think about them, the more I think that we as a congregation, we're actually quite brilliant in coming up with these because they're really clever. Like the more I think about it, the cleverer I realise we were in coming up with them. They have enormous potential to keep on shaping the culture of our church. Number one, two and four, um, so number three was about privacy and confidentiality. The others, they're principles that you will find all over the Bible. And I'm thinking especially of Paul's letters. Like if we unpacked the practical bit of Paul's letters, often Paul writes this kind of theory and then he gets into the practice stuff. Um, in those practical bits, you'll find traces of these principles all over the place. He's got this metaphor about the church being a body with many parts that are all different, an emphasis on unity through diversity. He appeals to people who are creating factions in the church and begs them to sort things, find ways of sorting out their disagreements. And he has this constant appeal to growing in maturity. Paul is promoting our ways of working together in his churches. I think that's cool. Um, I particularly want to look at that first one tonight, our first way of working together, and point out just how clever it is as a principle that guides our church. So here it is again. As a diverse congregation, we seek to value and respect the diversity of people, beliefs, opinions and experiences within our congregation. I suppose even if there's, you know, somebody who holds to the prosperity doctrine, you're welcome too, in spite of everything that, that Shane said. Uh, because we know that diversity makes us a better congregation. In his 2010 book, uh, What Do They Hear? Bridging the Gap Between Pulpit and Pew, one of my favourite scholars, Mark Allen Powell, no relation, he describes an experiment that he did with theological students involving that story that we heard Mark read tonight. Uh, it's known as the parable of the prodigal son. What Powell did is that he gathered together 100 American theological students and he asked them to read the text that we've just heard read, to read it silently, and then in pairs to retell the story to each other. And so Powell recorded what details of the story were told as each person uh, told that story and what details the students left out. And he observed that 100 students out of 100 students mentioned the younger son squandering his inheritance. However, only six students out of the 100 students mentioned that there was a famine. Did you notice that there was a famine? That detail was overlooked by 94 of the 100 students. A little while later, Mark Allen Powell found, him, found himself in St. Petersburg in Russia. And he decided to repeat the experiment. He couldn't find 100 theological students, but he found 50. And he asked them to do the same thing. 42 out of 50, 84%, if we want to you know, compare apples to apples, 84% mentioned the famine in their retelling of the story. Don't know if you know much about Russian history, but St. Petersburg suffered through an enormous fam famine uh, a few decades ago. Only 17 
of the 50, 34%, mentioned the son squandering his inheritance. Isn't that interesting? Later, Powell had the opportunity to spend some time in Tanzania. He lived there for a while. While he was there, he gathered a group of 50 Tanzanian theology students and he asked them the question, why does the younger son end up starving in the pig pen? You see, he was curious to see what the Tanzanian students would say. Would they see the son's situation as a result of him squandering his inheritance? Or would they see his situation as a result of the famine? 80 Tanzanian students answered, because nobody gave him anything to eat. That's why he ended in the pig pen. Do you know all three details are there in the story? And they have roughly equal emphasis. So the second half of verse 13 describes the son squandering his inheritance and maybe the first half of verse 14 as well. Verse 14 describes the famine. And the second half of verse 16 states that no one gave him anything. You see, all three were there. And yet, each group overlooked details that seemed blatantly obvious to the other groups. Along with observing different details, the three different groups had vastly different interpretations of this parable. The American students interpreted the dire situation of the son as a result of sin, the sin of his own moral failure. The famine was actually completely unimportant. Uh, you, could make, you could take that verse out and the parable would still make coherent sense. The Russian students, well, they were challenged by Powell. Well, surely the son's done something wrong, though. I mean, after all, the son says, Father, I have sinned. So, you know, the son's done something wrong. And when he challenged them on that, the students agreed, but they stated that the son's sin was foolish self-sufficiency. Because rather than value his family, he trusted in his own rugged individualism. And that was his sin. Because when famines come, as they inevitably do, only a fool would try to survive it by themselves. How the son spent his inheritance, well, that was largely irrelevant. I mean, all that did was put him in the same boat as everyone else. The parable made coherent sense without the son really getting the inheritance and squandering it. When Powell told them about the American students and what the American students said, the Russian students laughed and they said, well, isn't that typical of those capital Americans? They think that wasting money is the most sinful thing that you can do. Now, for the Tanzanians, the sin lay not with the sun, but with the far country. A society without honour that did not care for the stranger and the alien in its midst. And for them... The parable is a contrast between the father's house, which represents the kingdom of God, where the undeserving find a welcome, and the far country, represented by the scribes and the Pharisees who grumble that Jesus eats with sinners. Isn't that interesting? I suspect that probably most of us here would probably sit in the same place as the Americans, perhaps. That's the interpretation that we've mostly heard. Um, maybe not. Maybe, maybe some of you can identify with those other ones as well. The point is, in telling you about this experiment that Mark Allen Powell did, my goal isn't to debate which reading is the correct reading, but simply to demonstrate that the way that people perceive their world is shaped by the culture they're born into. We view the world through the lens of our culture without even being aware 
that we're wearing that lens. It's kind of like being born with a set of contact lenses that are coloured, colours everything red, and we can't conceive of viewing the world any other way until we encounter someone who's wearing a different set of contact lenses. Our culture isn't the only thing that colours our lenses. Other elements include our denominational background, prosperity doctrine or reform tradition, um, our gender, our political stance, the generation that we were born into, that we belong to, our socio-economic status, our experience of disability, traumatic experiences that we've had, our personality, the influence of those that we admire and respect. All of these things make up our set of contact lenses. Do you know, I was thinking about it. I bet our birth order affects the way we read the parable of the prodigal son. So all of these elements make up what we would call our social location in front of this text. My social location creates a lens between me and the words of this parable, the, world, well, the words of any text, actually. And that lens can both illuminate but also obscure what I read there. Does that make sense? So there are some details in a Bible reading that you notice because of who you are that I overlook. Even when I read that same text a dozen times, I just don't see it. And there are other details that I notice that you do not. So if we have an American, a Russian and a Tanzanian in our small group studying the story in Luke 15, we will get a much richer understanding of what is in this parable. But the parable hasn't changed at all. Only the way we've seen it has changed. And that is why our first way of working together is so, so clever. Because this doesn't just happen with our reading of the Bible. Our social location, that lens that we have, it impacts our perceptions of everything. Our perceptions of how the world operates, of how we think and feel about political and social issues, of how we respond to people who look different from us, of how we interpret what just happened in our family or in our friendship group, how we feel about walking into a church, how we feel and what we think about God. We need diversity in order to see more clearly. It's not just a politically correct HR idea. Because where we sit determines what we see. It is just too easy to divide the world into the people who are right, those who see things from my perspective, they're the people who are right, and the stupid people, or the hateful people. But you know, the older I get, the more I realise that the people who disagree with me, the ones who don't see things from my perspective, they're usually not stupid. They're usually not hateful. They just see something because of their location that I can't see because of mine. And if I assume that, well, they're just stupid or hateful, instead of trying my hardest to understand what is it that they see that I'm not seeing, I'm going to miss an opportunity to see further, to see more broadly, to see nuance in issues that I couldn't see before. Now, I might, of course, still end up disagreeing with them on any particular issue. I may strongly disagree. And I also may hold really strong boundaries around harmful behaviour. That's something different again. 
In fact, whether I agree or disagree with someone's opinion, I, we, need to be resolute about not tolerating actions that harm people and that damage people. But being committed to understanding someone else's viewpoint means that now I know things that I didn't know before. I'm a little bit more educated. And this, incidentally, overlaps with the last part of our second ways of working together, just, you know, a plug for it as well. We try to stay focused on solving the problem and avoid attacking the person. We aim to understand the other's viewpoint, especially when we disagree. Our congregation is really diverse in many, many ways. We have more sexual and gender diversity than any congregation I know. We also have a lot of neurodiversity. We've got a lot of economic diversity. We've got a lot of theological diversity. People who see their faith in quite different ways. And as a church, we have so gained from these areas of diversity. As we rub up against, we rub shoulders with people who are different, we learn things. Diversity makes our church better. We're also diverse in ways that you might not have realised. And I want to highlight two of those tonight because I think they're important. Firstly, we've got a real diversity of political and social views. And nowhere does diversity become such a heated source of tension as it does with political and social issues. It seems like if you sit politically right from me, then you must be a right-wing lunatic. And if you sit left of me, then you're some kind of woke leftist ideologue. And this increasing polarisation in Australian and global society does not serve us well. It is a false dichotomy. The idea that people could fit into one of two political boxes, left or right, is simplistic and it's unhelpful. And so is the idea that one of these boxes is the correct box in its entirety and thus can't be questioned, and the other is incorrect in its entirety, and anyone who sits in it is motivated by malice or hate. See, I have a spiritual gift of scepticism, and I've also got 60 years of life experience, and those two things tell me to believe otherwise. I just don't think that's true. So I'm really thankful that as I've moved around the congregation and talked to different people, I find a real diversity of political opinions and stances. And I want to say that there is room in this church for a wide variety of political views on a wide range of political and social issues. And radically inclusive means that no one is rejected or made to feel unwelcome because of a political opinion. Now, we also have a code of conduct as well as our ways of working together, and that outlines unacceptable behaviour. Um, and I read it, and holding a particular political view is not unacceptable behaviour. It's not written in there. I guess I want to say, be careful about assuming everyone um, shares your political views or that MCC Brisbane has some sort of monolithic political stance. It does not. If we can find the humility to genuinely believe that someone else might be able to see something that we can't see because of their social location, then I think this area of diversity also has the potential to make us a better, stronger church. It will help us to see further, help us to see nuances in an issue that others who live in echo chambers without that diversity don't have the ability to do so. I think we'll be ahead of the curve. Our congregation is 
also known for its diversity of sexualities. But there's a lot of layers to that diversity. And as I move around the congregation, I find people with very different opinions and practices around sex. Some people have decided that celibacy is the path for them. And sometimes that's a theological stance that they hold. And sometimes it's because they just have no desire to be any different than any, anything else but celibate. Others are really comfortable being in a sexually active relationship and they couldn't imagine living any other way. Some are committed to a monogamous relationship. Some aren't in relationships at all. Some have negotiated more open relationships. And for many, these stances and beliefs are in kind of a state of flux. Um, there's movement in people's positions, and yes, I threw that in as a deliberate pun. <laughs> but seriously, people grow and they change. They reflect and they explore their values and how to live in accordance to their values. And sometimes they even change their mind. It takes a while to figure this stuff out. And that is okay. So I want to say that in this area of sexuality, we might have really deep-seated opinions. We might disagree with others in our congregation. But number one, can we keep building a climate of grace? We're so good at that. We're here at MCC. This climate of grace can allow people to reflect and explore their own sexuality, their own values around that, and how that intersects with their faith without constantly having to look over their shoulders to assess um, how they're being perceived by others. I think that we can do that. I think that we are doing that. And number two, can we have the humility to acknowledge that we may not be able to see the whole picture? We may not be able to see what everybody else, uh, what somebody else sees. That someone else might be able to see something that we can't see because of our respective social locations or our experiences um, and just things that have happened to us in life. Embracing diversity and believing that it makes us a better church is one of our ways of working together. It's in writing, we've put it in writing, it's on our website, it's in our newsletter. But can we pull it off? Because that's a really hard thing to do. If you, um, if this has sparked anything in your mind, if you're sitting there going, I can't believe you're saying this, Denise, please come and talk to me and, um, and let's have a conversation about that. I'm really approachable. And uh, as I used to tell my college students, everything I say could be wrong, which always put them off a bit. <laughs> as a church, we don't really have a, a tightly defined set of doctrines. We've got a statement of faith, that's on our website too. But you know, it has more emphasis on experiencing God, experiencing God, than believing certain doctrines about God. But as a church, we have a really strong emphasis on this table. We believe that you don't get to choose, we don't get to choose who can come to this table and who can't. We call it the Lord's table and the Lord's supper. We don't get to write the guest list, Christ does, and he invites everyone, the right-wing lunatics and the woke leftist ideologues. He invites all of those in the rainbow. He invites their parents and loved ones as well. So, Jesus invites you to this table now. He welcomes you but there's just one catch. 
if you accept his invitation, you're going to have to sit around the table with all the others that he invites. You're going to have to eat and drink with them. You're going to have to share the cup and share the loaf with them. You're going to have to welcome those that Jesus welcomes. There's a table at either side of the room. And as the music plays in your own time, go take a piece of cracker, uh, gluten-free, and a cup of non-alcoholic juice, and then come back to your seat so that we can eat and drink together. Let's do that. Paul said 